So on behalf of the International Society for Sexual Medicine and the Journal of Sexual Medicine, it's a pleasure as the president of ISSM and past deputy editor of the journal to welcome you all to our webinar. First of all, I would like to introduce the visions of ISSM. We have the vision that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. And we have a mission that is to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education and professional development on human sexual health through the delivery of world class publications, research findings, online and in person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide. And the webinar is a part of this uh, mission we have and trying to fulfill our mission. The journals of our society is a backbone of our society and we have the three journals, our Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access, Sexual Medicine Reviews and our video journals. And it's a pleasure again to tell you that to this year our Sexual Medicine Reviews will have an impact factor and the other two paper journals already have an impact factor. So we have developed this seminar as a in a series of uh, webinars that we have developed because we have, don't have a meeting this year. We should have met in September in Japan. So therefore we will have our monthly webinars. And this webinar is the fifth webinar and it's in cooperation with the Journal of Sexual Medicine uh, to put a focus on the work that is being performed in our journals. If you want to know more about our webinars, please go to our website where you can find the past webinars. There are online and you can also see the future webinars when they will be and the topics. So it's a pleasure to introduce my uh, co-moderator, Tim Wines. Tim is uh, our uh, editing manager in our Journal of Sexual Medicine and also for the Open Access Journal. Tim has a PhD in evolutionary ecology, and he is also a founder of a project lead on data share. That is a tool that helps authors to identify journals uh, so they can find journals where they uh, can publish their things. So uh, welcome to Tim and thank you for the great work he's doing for our journal and he will be co-authoring this session. The next slide. So this is our program. First, we will have John Mulhall talking about publication ethics. We will have Jason Roberts talking about predatory journals, and we will have some case studies um, described by Linda Vignacci. And in the end, we will have the, our question and answer sessions. And the way that it's worked is that we will have all the questions after the talks. And you need to submit your questions uh, through the following button. You can see it here, um, the Q&A button. And then Tim and I will moderate the discussion and forward your questions to our presenters uh, this afternoon, morning, evening, wherever in the world you are. We will try to answer all your questions, but if we do not have the time, we will uh, send you a response or we will send the questions to the presenters and ask them to give a response to your questions. The next slide. So let's get started. We have a very nice program and it's a real pleasure to introduce you to the first speaker, our editor of Journal of Sexual Medicine. John has been the editor for several years now and is doing an outstanding job. Beside that, John is at the Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center where he is in charge of the sexual health program. So please, John, um, welcome and thank you for co-organizing this uh, webinar together with ISSM. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, good morning, everyone, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I want you to think about putting together a prospective clinical study, and you know very well that you would need ethics approval to do this. So when we do research, we're very familiar with the whole concept of getting uh, ethics committee approval, yet when it comes to publishing, it's incredible to me how many of us don't understand the ethics surrounding publication. Next slide, please. I have no commercial conflicts of interest to declare relevant to this discussion. Uh, very briefly, the four R's in scientific publishing should be, your article should be relevant to the journal in which it's being published. Your material should be rigorous. The science should be conducted in a rigorous fashion. It should be reproducible. This is incredibly important and methodology is so important. 
the methods need to be written so that any of us can reproduce your work. And then finally, and probably most importantly, it needs to be readable to the audience. Next slide, please. Uh, the most important career asset of any uh, academician or anyone in general is reputation. Um, once you lose your reputation, it's gone. So uh, treasure it and protect it. And that's really the driving force behind this presentation. Next slide, please. There are many sins in publishing, and this is a short version of a very much longer presentation, so it'll just give you a flavor of what we're really uh, discussing in this area. Plagiarism, fabrication, falsification, misciting of references, misreferencing, authorship malpractice, reviewer malpractice, undeclared conflicts of interest, and failure to acquire uh, institutional review board ethics or animal care committee approval. Next slide, please. So the consequences of this are varied depending on whether it is believed to be deliberate or an accident or depending on what kind of sin has been committed. Some of these sins are committed academic fraud. Certainly plagiarism would be top of that list. Manuscript rejection is a fairly common result of this. Black flagging, this is a phenomenon, and this occurs at JSM, where people send in an article that is heavily plagiarized, they're sent a warning letter, um, but they're, beside their name is, is a flag that makes us uh, go and look more carefully at the next submission from this author. So it does have immediate consequences. Being banned from publishing in a specific journal, we'll have a case uh, on this later on. A letter potentially being sent to your chairperson or to the dean of your institution or uh, chief of staff of your medical institution and potentially notification being sent to scientific organizations of which you were part of. Next slide, please. So fabrication is very obvious. Uh, this is a fake study and data, partial or complete. Uh, we certainly have seen this in the literature. It's uh, very hard to prove fabrication, but there are certainly uh, authors uh, in the field over the course of the last two decades where there was a very high suspicion that the literature was completely fabricated, often single center, single research mm -hmm. studies, incredible structure and data. It's just perfectly conducted perfect acquisition of data, no dropout, and really better than you or I could do at a center that has a lot of infrastructure and research, makes us question, is this even possible to do it this way? And so fabrication comes into our thinking. We may in fact ask you for the actual data. This is increasingly common, particularly in randomized control trials, where we may ask you to submit your data. This is done in a confidential fashion. It's reviewed by our statistician at looking for the integrity of the data. And the bottom line is just don't do it. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go into detail for this slide, but there are algorithms that are in place, pathways from COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, which is a nonprofit organization in Europe, uh, which gives excellent advice to editors on how to handle these situations. And there is almost an algorithm for practically every uh, sin that I've presented to you already. Next slide, please. Falsification is basically not fabricating data, but falsifying a portion of your paper. We've encountered something recently in the Journal of Sexual Medicine that made us very concerned about falsification. Uh, this is most notable in basic science papers where images are photoshopped, immunoblots, photomicrographs, or immunohistochemistry figures are photoshopped to make them look better. And that is falsification. And again, just don't do it. Next slide, please. Miscitation is... Next slide. Miscitation is not so much a, um, a lethal error. It is usually accidental, um, but is misrepresenting structure or findings from another study. And uh, most frequently it's based on, mis on quoting a miscitation within another paper. So for example, you write your paper and you cite a statement that is in another paper, which is a review paper, which has reviewed the literature and maybe has miscited the actual source data. If you're writing a paper and you're going to cite data and it's coming from a review paper, you really need to go to the source data and make sure that it is accurate. Okay, next slide, please. Misreferencing is very common. I'll show you data that we have acquired that gives you a sense for the uh, misreferencing. About one third of all papers have at least one form of misreferencing. Constructing a reference list that does not accurately represent the current literature. So I reviewed a paper some years ago for a journal that allowed 25 references and 21 of those references were from that journal. And that didn't represent the world's literature on the topic in question. Using a lot of review articles, book chapters or abstracts, I would strongly discourage you 
from including a reference to an abstract. Remember that we're looking for peer reviewed literature. Abstracts are while they undergo review, it is not at the level that a formal full research manuscript would be reviewed. So we discourage uh, you using abstracts as references. Using a lot of older articles. If you're uh, presenting data that is more than 10 years old, you really need to be justifying why that data is in your paper. Using a lot of your own work. Um, if it happens to be that you have written more than anyone else on the topic, then that's perfectly reasonable. But I think that you need to be absolutely certain that that is the case. Using a lot of references from the journal in which you're endeavoring to publish. Again, does the reference list represent the world's literature? Don't be lazy, be vigilant and go to source data. Next slide, please. So this is just a, uh, without going into great detail, you can see the categories, incorrect reference utilization, errors of interpretation or data translation and suboptimal reference or utilization. It's very common that this appears in our literature. It is predominantly accidental, but it's something that's worthwhile uh, stopping. So if you have a fellow or a resident or a medical student help you write your paper, as a senior author, it's really incumbent upon you to go to the reference list and make sure that the reference list is appropriate. Next slide, please. This is work that Landon Trost and myself did um, that hopefully we will publish in the not too distant future. We looked at uh, sexual medicine papers over a course of a three-year period. There were a total of 468 uh, citations. And if we look at the uh, the list, errors of interpretation, 6%, uh, one third were, uh, were erroneous, 6% errors of interpretation, 14% suboptimal references, and 12% incorrect references. And you can see how they're broken down over there. And I suspect if you go back and look at your papers, as I have done, you'll see that we do this quite frequently. And it's something that's worthwhile paying attention to. Next slide, please. Uh, authorship malpractice, this is a, a very uh, significant concern. It's an increasing concern. Authorship manipulation is a, a very serious problem in our field. Um, let's say, for example, we get a case series coming in of 60 patients with 16 authors on it. This is not uncommon. Okay, so everyone who is on that list needs to have made a significant intellectual or physical um, contribution to the paper. Failure to credit co-authors is a huge problem. This is a very serious problem, which can be deemed academic fraud if it's deliberate. And so um, we have a case presentation on that. And then we get authorship disputes all the time coming in the journal. An author wants his name taken off the paper. An author doesn't believe another author's name should be on there. And these are very complicated to deal with. And we follow the COPE guidelines in this regard. Next slide, please. Authorship manipulation. So we've got a maximum number of eight authors allowed uh, for papers. Now, as a senior author, if you happen to have 16 authors, let's say a large multi-center investigation, it's perfectly reasonable in your cover letter to justify ahead of time, up front, why you need so many authors. All authors, as I said, must make a significant contribution. Um, this is a, a common thing from history, at least. Uh, putting your sure person's name on the manuscript without any involvement whatsoever is not an appropriate way. Uh, to uh, uh, list authorship. And likewise, putting your friend's name on there is not appropriate. Everyone must make a significant contribution. This is not a victimless event. And the reason for that is that uh, we move up the ladder in academia, we get onto committees, we become chairpersons, we get on editorial boards, we become editors-in-chief, um, based largely upon our CV and the number of papers that we have and the H index of those papers. So if we're just adding people's names to authorship list, it creates a downstream negative effect. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Cope's diagram. We won't go into this in great detail, but as you go around the clock, you can see the, the uh, all kinds of author type problems. Corresponding author seems unable to respond to viewers' comments. That should ring alarm bells. Manuscript was drafted or revised by someone not on the author list or not acknowledged. Tracking in manuscript shows that the authors have been added or removed impossibly prolific author. Uh, we do see that on occasion, authorship changes without notification during revision stages and so on and so forth. And these are the COPE guidelines and we follow these COPE guidelines, guidelines very carefully. So be very cautious about who's on your paper as an author. Next slide, please. Reviewer malpractice is another very infrequently discussed issue, urging self-citation. I've reviewed this paper and the list of references missing these two papers, they're both mine. That is discouraged by the Committee on Publication Ethics, there would need to be a very robust reason why you as a reviewer would be uh, putting forth your name 
uh, as a reference um, on the paper in question. Competing interests, if you happen to be in the same field as the uh, author of the paper, you're reviewing the paper. If you believe you're conflicted upfront, you should state that. Uh, but competing interests is a significant concern. Misappropriation of authors' research ideas, this is classic academic fraud. You reject a paper, and then several months later, you publish on the very same topic, taking that original author's ideas and using them. This is a very serious uh, problem. Manuscript decision, decision colored by being an editorial board member or an editor-in-chief or an associate editor of another journal. Inappropriate language within review. The reviews are done to be constructive, to help people make the paper better, and therefore it should be done in a, con a collegial and congenial fashion. Subordinate reviewing is where you, as a famous expert, start pawning off this review to somebody who's junior to you, a resident or a fellow, without ever having looked at the actual review that's submitted. This is very, very important. Would you want that done to your paper is how I always view this. You really, as the person who's been asked to review this paper, should review it. I have no problem you including a subordinate in the process for education purposes, but the final decision and the final review must be done by you. Next slide, please. Undeclared conflict of interest. This is very obvious. The implications are very, are very clear. Full disclosure of relationships, industry, nonprofit organizations, even editorial team uh, positions would, we would consider important. It is the editorial leadership which decides whether they are conflict of interest. You are simply making a disclosure. It's very, very rare that COI results in the rejection of a paper. We might write you a letter saying, uh, please update your conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. And finally, plagiarism, use of words or phrases or paragraphs or sentences directly cut from other work with or without attribution. Cope talks about the concept of text recycling. You've probably heard the term self-plagiarism, which is a significant concern. You cannot use paragraphs from prior works that you've done and put them into new paper. This becomes a copyright issue. Very simply, you just have to change the wording that you have used. You may be an investigator who writes uh, the, the, the most prolific author in a particular area in sexual medicine and you're borrowing from other papers, that's okay, but you cannot use exact wording from those papers. It may be challenging for you to recognize this. Your fellow has written a paper, you see it, it looks excellent. How do you know that text has been cut and pasted from another paper without it having been um, cited or referenced? It's very difficult. Uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we are exploring the idea, and I believe this will go through, of every paper that comes out of the institution eventually having been screened by plagiarism software. And I think that really is the future of the field, to make sure that you are protected when a junior writes your paper. This is academic fraud. Next slide, please. All JSM submissions undergo plagiarism screen using the Authenticate software. Grid in a 25% similarity triggers formal review of overlap. Significant overlap, uh, authors are asked to rewrite. And if this is repetitive, it can lead to serious consequences for the author. Next slide, please. That's my final slide. It's my pleasure to be here today and I'm looking forward to hearing the other talks. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Roberts. Um, Jason earned a doctorate in geography from Loughborough University. Uh, and then he worked at Backwell Science in Oxford he moved to the editorial team at Origin um, and was the founder of that organization and has been, uh, was also the president of um, the ISMTE, which is the uh, uh, organization for managing editors and technical editors and is an all round leading light in um, peer review. So uh, he is going to talk to us about predatory journals. Over to you, Jason. Hi everyone, um, it's great to be back involved. Uh, some of you may remember me as the original managing editor for the Journal of Sexual Medicine. I've been there right from the start. And uh, today I'm gonna to talk about a problem that unfortunately is particularly problematic for uh, this field. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna talk about predatory journals. Uh, JSM is the acronym for a well-known um, predatory publisher. So unfortunately, we're caught right in the crosshairs of a number of the conversations I'm about to uh, go over with you on predatory journals. Um, so we all think we know what a predatory journal uh, is. So we've probably all received the emails. 
Um, and uh, loosely they can be defined as that they're offering all these things that uh, such as rapid peer review and publication, but there's no real evidence that they deliver any of this. And even if you go to one of their websites, if you're considering publication in, in a journal, like don't necessarily know predatory, you can go there and read what looks like a perfectly legitimate outline of what they can offer. Um, but the problem is, and this is what really truly defines predatory journals, is that they do not apply basic publication standards. So that could, could be peer review, um, but it is most certainly issues such as typesetting, uh, critically, things like archiving, so that, I mean, we don't think about these things, but when your article is published, there's a whole series of things that happen to make sure that that, ar that uh, article is archived forever. Um, and uh, that just simply does not happen with predatory journals. Uh, and then there's issues of online discoverability that uh, frankly, a lot of articles that get published in these journals can never be found. Not, you know, they're buried deep, deep, deep within a Google search and you're certainly not gonna find them on PubMed. Um, the critical thing that I want you to take away from this uh, though today is that predatory journals, I mean, the term itself is very loaded. It sounds like they're totally nefarious, they're evil things. Um, but lumped in with that, because those certainly do exist, um, are some journals that are just quite simply awful. They're amateur efforts. Uh, they're, they're set up with you know, good intentions, but people don't really know what they're doing. I mean, you, you could probably get away with doing the peer review side of things, um, but um, you simply, are, unless you are a professional, you simply would not know how to do the archiving and, uh, and the typesetting. So anyway, um, the other critical thing that I'd like you to, to, to bear in mind, because I hear this all the time still, even after all these years, is that, okay, all predatory journals are open access. By nature, they are all open access. You can go and look at any article that's, that they publish. But it's critical to understand that most open access journals are not predatory. Now, when they first came out, a lot of people thought that, well, they seem a little bit corrupt. I mean, you pay to publish, is that what it is? But it's an important distinction, and, and not least because we ourselves publish sexual medicine open access. I don't think anyone would accuse that of being predatory. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, perhaps the best way to define predatory journals is simply their behavior. And uh, their email behavior is the most obvious thing. We get flooded with these things on a daily basis. I tend to get about five a day. Um, and they're pretty easy to detect. Um, usually they have a title that mirrors. It's very similar. To, so you might get something like uh, JSM uh, International Sexual Medicine Journal. Well, that sounds like it could be from us, but it's not. It's a fake journal. Um, I just made that up on the spot. That's how easy it is. They literally just plug a, 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 an algorithm, just spitting these names out. Um, you can also look for a non-standard use of English, which I appreciate is probably harder if English is not your native language. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's interesting because quite often they are overly formal. You know, it's your, your esteemed uh, whatever, you know, nobody uses the word esteemed in, in a regular uh, journal e uh, email. Um, or sometimes it's overly familiar, like, hi, Jason. You know, well, that's also kind of inappropriate if you're just trying to get a paper from me. Uh, this example on screen, which is actually kind of funny, is uh, an example of a poorly worded uh, email. Uh, and ironically, they, they were impressed with my response and rebuttal to uh, a comment that somebody made on an editorial I'd put in JSM about predatory journals. So um, I always assumed that it was just computers scanning, uh, um, you know, what's published and then generating these fake emails. But uh, there was an article a few years ago, I think it was in The Economist, where it actually showed that there were uh, actual humans doing this, uh, which is kind of surprising. But unfortunately, you can't really believe a lot of what they, they say. So the peer review policy, pe pu paper publication is 40 to 90 days. First of all, there's no paper version of this journal, despite what they say. And the peer review policy is, is a copy and paste effort of, of what they've just seen on other journal websites. And there's no evidence because they also promised me publication in three days. So there's no way that you could do peer review and publication in three days. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you probably heard of Beale's List. Beale's List was the original, Beale, Jeffrey Beale was the guy who came up with the term predatory journal, and he created a list of what he deemed predatory publications. Now, he should take credit for shining light on the problem, um, but I'm afraid Je Jeffrey Beale kind of overextended his reach a bit. And um, first of all, he arbitrarily applied the label predatory journal to anything that he didn't like the look of. Um, there was no real clear criteria what appeared on the list. Uh, I actually met Jeffrey Beale once and I told him about, uh, I told him about JSM and said that there was a rival uh, fake journal out there and he said, oh, I'll just put it on the list. 
uh, if you send me an email. So, you know, there wasn't really any auditing of what was and what wasn't legitimate. Um, and eventually Beale got a lot of criticism, not least because he conflated open access journals with predatory journals. And um, when I saw him in 2016, he even admitted to me then that he was done with it. And sure enough, he closed it down in 2017. Um, you can find versions of it out there still on the, on the web. But uh, anyway, um, there was an effort around about at the same time in 2017 to try and systematically synthesize what might constitute a predatory journal. And um, I was actually part of that uh, study. I'm one of the et al's on that reference at the bottom. And uh, next slide, please. And one of the things that uh, we came up with in this research was some of the criteria uh, for how to spot a predatory journal. Now, we received some criticism for this. People said, well, you know what? Now you're just going to give them the roadmap as to how to appear legitimate. And uh, an argument you could make, I'm not sure this was one that we necessarily fully believe, but an argument you could make is, well, honestly, if they actually all did these things that were legitimate practices, then maybe there's a case to say that they've gone from being, you know, corrupt to being legitimate. They've gone legit, to use the English phrase. Uh, but some of the salient characteristics are probably familiar to you, some of them may be less so, but uh, you'll often find that this journal will be, they're, they're just, it's a call for papers for anything, so it might be gynecology and forestry, and it's like, well, what's the connection there? I'm not sure. Um, usually there's spelling and grammar errors, which I, again, appreciate is maybe harder to spot if English is not your native language. Um, often they'll, they'll talk about the index Copernicus value. That's a complete nonsense metric. If you ever see a journal talking about that, you need to run in the opposite direction. It's absolutely fake. Um, the, the rapid publication is the, is, the, is the most evident one. If they're saying we're putting together our November issue now, we're, it's October, and, 29th day or whatever it is at the end of the month, then you know that it's it's fake. There's no legitimate journal in the world that can turn around peer review and do all the proper publishing steps, including getting it ready for indexing um, in that amount of time. OK, it's just it's fake. Um, they promise a very low publication charge, often less than 150 bucks US. Um, so uh, you know, just look out for that. It sounds like a deal, but it, it probably isn't. It, literally, they, they might take your Word file and put it up on a website. So, I mean, I could do that. Um, so the other thing that you might want to spot is that they typically say, email your papers to us. Well, there are still the odd legitimate journals out there that, that, that don't have an editorial management system like Scholar One or Editorial Manager. But uh, for the most part, if they're asking you to email their manuscript, you know that it's probably a predatory journal or it's a really poorly run amateur journal. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so we do make these common assumptions. Um, we assume that it's just gullible authors that are publishing there. I, I can't believe that and, and, you know, anyone would submit to one of those journals. Well, you'll be surprised who shows up in these journals. Um, but the implication is that gullible authors are probably inexperienced authors or maybe people that aren't, you know, haven't got anything of any great importance to say because if they did, then they'd probably be publishing in a bigger name journal. Um, authors with unpublishable or continually rejected work. Yeah, you, you know, we see at journals, we, you can see a paper being shopped around. And I mean, we've, we, you, know, you can see it here, where it just gets, you know, it's been to one of our rival journals first. And, and you know, eventually it just keeps going down and down and down. And, um, oh, look, there's a predatory journal I can publish there. And I say publish, I'm going to put that in quotation marks because you're not really published just because you appear there. Um, and then, of course, there's the, uh, there's the, um, authors themselves just trying to uh, um, um, get through some fake results or whatever. So it's a race to the bottom there. We've got a fake journal publishing fake results. Um, but again, like I said, the evidence does not show the case. Uh, this is the case. And in 2017, David Moore published an article in Nature that showed that, in fact, there was NIH funded research appearing in these uh, predatory journals. There was a lot of US based authors. I think there was an assumption that, the, that these authors were in certain countries in the world. Well, yeah, OK, well, the US was the number two country for um, um, the source of submissions. India was the number one country, you were closely followed by the US. So I'm telling you all this, next slide please, because this really does affect us. And you might think, well, it doesn't affect me personally. I've never submitted to a predatory journal. Um, I suspect if we did, if I looked at the publication record of everyone that's on this uh, webinar today, one of you will have published something in there and you won't have even realized that that will have happened. So why are predatory journals problematic? Well, they're good, valid science. Um, 
it remains unusable or undiscoverable. We cannot find that material. You put it in a predatory journal, it is gone. It is, it, it, you cannot find it buried deep in a Google search. It's never going to appear on PubMed. If you realize later that you published in a predatory journal and then try and take it to a journal like JSM, we can't publish that anymore because the, the, these, these journals, even though they're corrupt, uh, waste no time in, in trying to protect their copyright. You, you handed that, that paper over to them, it is lost. You cannot go and publish it in a legitimate journal later. Uh, conversely, um, the potential exists that you do find these articles and then they get vacuumed up into the, into the accepted literature. So it might appear in a systematic review. Um, a journal uh, article might just you know, casually cite this because it says something that they think is, is of relevance to what they're trying to say, but in fact, it's, it's, it's not been peer reviewed or it could even be a legitimate research. We do not know, um, you know, the, 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 the veracity of this material. There's no way to know for sure that this was ever checked. And so this is a problem because it could send us off in the wrong direction with research. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, but the final point I just want to make on that, though, is that um, do, do, do bear in mind that if funders find out that you published in one of these journals, they're not going to count that. So if they're looking for you to have published, you know, like that there was any NIH papers I just mentioned, they're not going to count that as a legitimate publication. That's a problem. OK, so what do predatory journals tell us about legitimate journals? Here's the issue. They exist because legitimate journals are doing such a terrible job themselves. I like to think that ISSM certainly is, and its a portfolio of journals, we're not in that uh, bracket, but uh, we have very high standards. But unfortunately, a lot of journals do not. And to make matters worse is that their, their whole peer review process is very opaque. There's no transparency at all. You don't really know what goes on at a lot of these journals. Did they really peer review it or did it just kind of get waved through? Um, Dr. Mulhall refers to these things as breakfast reviews. You can tell when someone's just, you know, uh, quickly read the paper while eating their toast in the morning and then send us back a line saying, yeah, I think it's good enough to publish. You know, many journals, that they will take that as their peer review. Uh, and so this is a problem because um, it is very easy to fake uh, because you look legitimate, but because you could just put a website up in an hour, I'd say a few words that sound like a peer review process is underway and away you go. Um, so legitimate journals have to become more transparent. Publishers need to also show the amount of work that they do. We don't mean, you know, every, everyone likes to throw stones at Elsevier, but you know, and publishers like that, but they actually do a lot of work to make the paper uh, archivable, indexable, uh, and actually typeset in a, in, a, in a way that uh, you can actually um, you know, use and read. Um, we also need to reflect on the fact that these journals exist because there are many authors out there that are disenfranchised. Maybe you yourself feel like you're one. Um, you know, if you, if you uh, are, uh, are working in select countries in the world, there is no doubt about it. There is a bias against that. I mean, we cannot hide behind that. In, in Western-centric journals, um, you know, there is, a, there is a, this disenfranchisement that, that's going on. And so, um, you know, this, and I think this is where the, uh, the predatory journals that aren't in fact predatory, the, the, the amateur efforts, this is why they exist. And perhaps there's more that can be done to help those journals become um, you know, proper functioning journals. Um, and then sadly, it, we, we need to recognize that there is flawed and fake research going through legitimate journals too. Um, you know, and JSM in particular in its early days had to have its firewalls up really high. Um, you know, there was a couple of times we saw stuff coming in that we just, we just could, could not um, attest to the veracity of it, so we didn't publish it. And uh, uh, so we have to realize that this is a problem that affects us all. This is not something that just affects um, people that published in these journals. It affects you too. You as a reader, you as a researcher. Okay. And then finally, my take home points, the last slide. Uh, so there are, there is evidence-based criteria now for what constitutes a, um, um, a predatory journal. Um, and you can go out there and find it. I'm sure, you know, go find a version of Beale's List if you want. Just always, if you're not familiar with this journal, do some research before you either accept that editorial board appointment or, or, or submit a paper to it. And by the way, if you get an article solicitation and it's not from Drs. Mulhall, Schindel or Goldstein, it's not coming from an ISSM journal, okay? Uh, so just beware, because again, this, this field in particular is heavily attacked by predatory publications. Um, and uh, okay, so I think I will leave it there and hopefully I've uh, provided some insights for you all. Thank you so much, Jason, for a really, really nice presentation. And now it's a pleasure to introduce to you Linda Vignocci, 
she will talk about and give some example of case studies in ethical infraction. Linda is an associate editor in endocrinology at the University of Florence. And she's also leading the um, research program in the department. Linda is involved everywhere. She is involved in the European Society for Sexual Medicine. She is on the scientific uh, planning of uh, our ISSM meeting, and she's also working hardly in the ISWISH. And lately she joined the Journal of Sexual Medicine as a deputy editor. So a warm welcome to you, Linda. Linda, we don't hear you yet. No, no. Yes, now we do. Now, okay. So, um, so I want to thank Anna Maria for the night presentation, and I'm very happy to uh, see all these uh, very important friends for the SSM community. So, um, in the following minutes, we should try to give some example of cases that deserve and uh, has deserved the careful evaluation for ethical infraction. And the first one is related to plagiarism. So plagiarism is a, a very uh, is a very important topic already discussed by John. And uh, the, uh, this case is a very long story. I, we met this uh, case uh, um, one year ago. So there was a paper which was submitted by single center and uh, um, the paper was show you know, an important overlap with the previous one already published by GSM. And uh, a lot of sentences and paragraphs were coming from uh, the, previous one, the previous paper with a cut and paste uh, methodology. And uh, so the paper, the paper was uh, immediately reject and uh, after discussion by GSM leadership. Then uh, the authors uh, were, uh, were advised about this by an immediate and important and very severe warning letter informing that they, um, this is considered actually a very important infraction and also an academic fraud. And uh, so um, they were also advised not to make any more as a type of some this type of infraction otherwise uh, the future any future infraction would result in penalty and uh, then uh, unfortunately less than one year later uh, we receive another paper from uh, the same center with the three authors uh, overlapping with the previous one and uh, again the same story so 62 percent of overlap with uh, the other paper again Again, uh, the method used was uh, the, the cut and paste uh, methods uh, of wall sentences and uh, paragraph, and uh, 60 percent of overlap with other paper published in uh, sexual uh, medicine reviews by the same author. So um, this is a very important topic, as I told you before, and uh, there is a very, a very tight and precise uh, uh, flowchart of uh, action that we should uh, accomplish. And uh, this is the COPE uh, flowchart. So what do we have to do when we suspect a plagiarism? And just saying that also a reviewer can inform the editor about suspected plagiarism. And so we have to check for the degree of copying and uh, in the best, uh, um, in the, in the best, uh, uh, in the best situation, uh, no problem uh, is actually observed. And so we can discuss uh, with the reviewer and just saying that most probably uh, there was some error, but no problem is appears with, uh, with uh, the paper. Then the second condition can be, can be uh, that present if uh, copying is uh, actually 
present, but the copying is related to authors' home own uh, work. So we can speak about a redundancy. And so we have to check for uh, the minor or the major overlap. So the type of overlapping. If a minor of overlap is present, um, is uh, we'll see later on what we could plan to do. And uh, uh, the other cases, the other two cases on the left side are the minor copying of short phrases only from other published paper. And so we have to contact um, in corresponding author, just ask to uh, rephrase and to revise these overlapping uh, uh, sentences of period. And then we can proceed with uh, uh, the normal review, but we have to pay attention to no misattribution of data that should be there. When we are in front of the clear a case of plagiarism, so this is the most uh, uh, worst one, clearly, we uh, should pay attention to the um, large use of portion of text and data presented by, by the author. So um, sometimes it should be also misattribution of data, and this is a very important uh, uh, case, an important uh, part of plagiarism. And uh, so we should uh, send, uh, uh, contact the corresponding author by writing and saying that uh, they should, documenting the plagiarism, and then uh, ask the author to explain and to respond to uh, the inquiry made by the, the editor. And so uh, some different cases can can be observed, so we can observe that uh, the author did not does not respond, and is uh, so we can attempt to contact all uh, other authors uh, from uh, uh, the paper. And uh, so if we have no response again, we should contact the author's institution or also other authorities uh, from the department or research governance of uh, the institution. So there is a step-by-step -step procedure, but uh, um, uh, again, uh, we should go, uh, go ahead with uh, uh, finding a solution and the resolution of the case. If the authors respond or a quarter responds, they should respond in a satisfactory way. And so if uh, um, the author uh, explanation is evaluated and if considered not um, unsatisfactory paper uh, should be rejected and consider informing authors superior or other research governance. And on the other way, if it is uh, uh, considered satisfactory, uh, for example, honest error and admitted error, or think about that there could be very young researchers that can have made this, uh, um, th this case paper is rejected, but a revision and uh, it could be allowed. So in this way, some open space and the, the door still remain open for another submission. Finally, we should uh, summarize, which is the GSM response to plagiarism. And it's important to summarize that all manuscripts that get, get screened by, by the editor for plagiarism by using plagiarism software. And uh, when uh, after filtering out for the abstract and references, any overlap value, as John stated, uh, above 25% need and is uh, sent uh, is sent for investigation and careful investigation. If uh, the overlap uh, is not significant, the manuscript received um, the formal, uh, can, the manuscript received the formal review. And so we can uh, um, go ahead with a normal process. Otherwise, if the, uh, the investigation say that the overlap is significant, so uh, we have to to discriminate between uh, self-plagiarism or true plagiarism by uh, another paper with uh, some other authors. And all in the case of self-plagiarism, the author receive an email uh, requesting to write, to write again the section that are uh, um, cut and copied by the same author. 
And uh, uh, on, the other, on the other hand, we, if we have a true plagiarism, so the plagiarism is the most severe, the most severe um, case and the paper should be rejected and then uh, by a formal letter, a formal email also alerting the authors for future uh, problem with uh, uh, with uh, the same uh, ethical infraction and the plagiarism in the future would result in penalty what kind of penalties should be uh, applied so um, a ban so the authors could be banned from the journal or uh, an alert to to the institution or any other uh, sexual medicine societies where the author is uh, involved. And actually for uh, this paper that I present to you, all these three penalties were uh, taken into account and were, um, were applied. So it was the, the very bad story that finished in uh, an even worse way. So the other case is a failure to credit co-author. This is another important topic. Uh, and this is case uh, uh, was related to a paper that was submitted from a single center with four authors. And uh, the paper was uh, reviewed and rejected by, um, by review system, but uh, um, not so far and not so, um, uh, sorry, the, the paper was also suggested to, to, to be submitted to an open access. So we opened the, the door to submit it to our uh, partner journal. Then uh, later, a very similar paper was submitted again to Journal Sexual Medicine, uh, Medicine with only a single author. And the author from the second paper was the first author of the original paper. So um, it was closely reviewed and it was clear that the work were exactly the same and a lot of things and data were shared and were cut and copied from the previous, the previous paper. So the uh, author of the second paper that was a single author was asked to explain the almost identical nature and data uh, present in the second paper without crediting the co-authorship. And so the response stated that the work belonged to them and the authors of, from the first paper did not deserve credit. So, I mean, this uh, uh, was uh, the reply by the single author. And the response was deemed unsatisfactory by GSM leadership. And so the senior author of the original paper was then receive an email by an alert by GSM editor just saying what was happening there. And the single author of the, of the second paper has been finally banned for uh, uh, for 12 months uh, um, and uh, for failing to credit uh, co-authorship, which is, uh, uh, as uh, uh, John mentioned before, is as a very important, severe and uh, <clears throat> ethical infraction. So another case is related to failure to obtain uh, the ethical approval and the ethical committee approval. And this is a story of a retrospective analysis of routine patient data that was submitted to GSM and no indication that ethical committee approval was uh, present, was there in the manuscript. And so the editor um, asked to the corresponding author to a statement uh, and uh, a precise uh, um, reference to the <coughs> ethical committee at the committee approval, but the authors claimed that, that this type of study uh, did not need approval in their country. So uh, the editor, we should state and we should uh, uh, clearly emphasize that the authors routinely, routinely ask for ethical approval uh, um, in uh, the manuscript uh, for every research manuscript, including clinical data. And so we, this is a very important part of the reviewing process, which is extremely, extremely carefully uh, revised. And uh, this is uh, also true for studies uh, from countries where the type of study may not require ethic committee approval and the authors may claim this uh, by um, replying to the, uh, to, the, to the editor. But the editor, we have to clearly state that the editors cannot 
uh, should not be expected to know all the national and every national guideline. So a letter from the ethic committee stating, for example, that the study in that country does not require ethic approval should be asked. And uh, so the author should be asked to uh, prove these uh, um, national guideline, uh, uh, guideline and also to uh, report and to present document that the national standards should uh, uh, not uh, uh, should uh, not requiring uh, uh, the ethical committee approval for such a study it should also be asked to be submitted. So um, if the editor discovered that the study did require the ethical approval in the in uh, the state on the nation where the the study has been carried uh, and the authors failed to obtain approval or to or uh, in um, was again uh, to uh, state that there is no need for this approval. The editor has the responsibility to reject the paper and then uh, to uh, follow and to uh, follow exactly um, th this um, this case uh, with the author's institution and uh, the local ethic committee just to uh, advise what is happening there. And so uh, what happened to our case? The authors claimed that the study did not need approval and the editor um, asked for the proof of this uh, uh, lack uh, of uh, um, uh, lack of law on this uh, uh, study and uh, a letter from the Institution of Ethics Committee stating that the study do, does not require ethical approval was not provided in this case by the, the, the author, and so the paper was rejected. Linda, I'm uh, sorry, but we have to keep a little track of the time. Yeah, so yeah. Um, coming back to the very uh, final conclusion, so there was some uh, salami slicing here, but we can discuss later on. The take home message here is uh, to consider that an amount of time is spent checking and dealing with the violation of et ethical integrity or checking for, for this. And uh, multiple submission can also corrode future research on the topic. Queen, so we have to alert and to advise uh, the authors about this and uh, the violation of public uh, for publication ethics undermines credibility of science and also of the author, so can undermine his or her academic career. And due to all these reasons, the editorial teams are progressively tougher sanctioning and punishing um, these uh, behaviors. So pay attention to this. Uh, and uh, I want to thank finally to all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, that was really great. Okay, so we have uh, a few minutes. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, whiz through a few of the questions we've got there. Um, in the chat, there is one from uh, Dr. Abdal Mia, um, which is about uh, detection of plagiarism um, and whether there should be punishments for it. I think probably I'm the best person to ask that one because I'm in charge of plagiarism assessment at JSM. Um, so there's, there's sort of two things, there's text copying and that's a part of plagiarism more broadly. And um, a plagiarism more broadly is taking ideas from other people and um, claiming them as your own. And one way of doing that is by taking their text and putting it into your own article. So we have this program called Authenticate, which assesses the amount of copied text, as um, Linda was saying. And then we, we apply that to every manuscript and ones that are have problems are either sent back to the authors or if there is a very large problem uh, and that a lot of text has been copied uh, we begin a more serious investigation um, and that can lead to being banned from the journal or a letter going to the department. Thank you for responding to that question. Tim, um, I have a question uh, from Dr. Nugu that asked, uh, I think this is for Linda, what about salami slicing? Because you didn't have the time to, to cover that. So now you can talk a little bit about that. So using the same data, data set uh, and submitted to different journals with different strides, styles of writing or written uh, with a different angle. So um, what do you think we should respond to that, Linda? 
You have to put on your um, mic. So the salami slicing is actually that. So uh, splitting um, and uh, repeating your uh, data in different in different uh, uh, papers. So, for example, the same data in two manuscripts by the same author without appropriate reference to previously published article is a is a pure case of salami slice, uh, slicing. But uh, we can say that uh, there there are some condition where uh, a paper cannot be considered salami slicing or duplicate publication, for example, when uh, we have publication of professional guidelines in two or more um, paper in journal in different languages uh, or in different journal, which are the reference for different uh, scientific society. Or for example, when we have a follow up uh, investigation with parts of already published results, when the new manuscript has a high scientific impact, we can allow it. Or for example, in a large epidemiological study or lar larger randomized controlled trials, it's almost impossible to present all the data and all the results in a single manuscript. So we, in this case, it's allowed to, um, to put some data with a clear reference to the previous paper. And so these are not considered ethical infraction in this case. I don't know if... Uh, it's clear now. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we all see it when, when we do a search, suddenly you'll see that same data comes up in several uh, papers that you, you identify using PubMed. Oh. So um, we have uh, another question, maybe that is for you, Jason. Dr. Sand asks, how many predatory journals are there in the field of urology and where can we find the list? Mm, do you know, that's a really good question. Um, there is, the answer is there's no way to know uh, and new ones just come and go uh, suddenly you'll see something new appearing in your email inbox uh, my advice would be and uh, the reference was in in my slides is to go look at that um, bmc medicine article that we published in 2017 and just apply that criteria every time that you're looking at a journal um, there is a service out there called cabell c-a-b-e-l-l uh, they provide a modern day version of the Beals list, but you have to pay to get it. Your library may have paid uh, to get access to it. Cabels, to me, though, does the same thing that Beals does. We don't know what criteria they use to put those articles, those journals uh, on their list, but uh, that would be a source. Um, but honestly, we don't know how many art, uh, journals there are because they just literally create them on the fly. I just uh, got a, a note on the chat saying there's a green list with all the recognized journals. Is that something you want to comment on, Jason? Yeah, there could. There could. I mean, the, one of the one way that you could do it to flip this around it would be to look at yeah. what do we know that's legitimate. And and my advice there would be to go look at something like the you know the list for the impact factor, the Web of Science, or whatever it's called these days. So again, the best advice I would give you is if you're not sure and you you can't apply the criteria I just mentioned, is talk to your librarian uh, if you have access to if you're at an institution that you can just any librarian will know how to handle this. They will go do the work for you. They're they're sat there waiting for you to come ask that question. So if you're not sure. Um, and though Tim will probably hate me for saying it, sometimes just ask the journal. We will also know, you know, roughly what's going on. Um, I've certainly fielded those questions in the past from people. Do you have Absolutely. a question, Tim? Um, yes. Um, so there's also a question here about any programs recommended to be used to avoid plagiarism for normal users. Um, and that's uh, from Jose Flores. My recommendation is to just uh, do a quick Google search. Um, there's lots of free plagiarism detection software. Um, I recommend doing this, of course, if you're writing the paper yourself, you'll know if you cut and pasted a lot of text from somewhere else. But if you're a co-author, remember that co-authors are responsible for all the contents of the article. So if you're, the, um, it is well worth doing a quick plagiarism check um, on articles on which you're a co-author to make sure that there hasn't been anything going on that you're not aware of. Um, and there is free software out there on the online which should help you spot whether there's text uh, that's been copied from a lot of different places. Um, uh, so, I think that answers a couple of questions. As well. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for you, John. Um, it's from Dr. Sand asking, is there formal training or publication ethics in residency or fellowship training programs? 
is publication ethics part of the faculty development training programs at medical schools? So uh, it's nice to see that Granham has joined. Granham is a urologist who's uh, very well known in our field. So it's a, I appreciate your question. So maybe uh, he knows you are running a program or what? So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a urologist. So I'll, I'll speak about urology. Um, we spent five years training urologists how to uh, evaluate patients, how to manage them, how to operate on them. Um, we even go as far as to train them how to uh, be ethical in their research. Uh, but we do things very, very poorly in urology residency. And I suspect this is true of all residencies. We don't teach them how to do statistical analysis properly. And we don't teach them about publication ethics. And I'm not aware of any program in the United States that has a formal uh, lecture or course in publication ethics, nor am I aware of any um, medical center that has that as part of their core curriculum for faculty members. And it's quite, it's quite crazy to me because we probably have all inadvertently um, broken ethics in our, in our publications. So I think that this effort is the first step, I hope, in increasing awareness to this, in this regard. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Tiefer. When did the predatory journals phenomenon start? Do you know that, Jason? Yeah, it's, well, it's hard to say there was a definitive date, but I would say probably by about 2010, we were starting to notice this. And I think Beale really hit his stride in about 2012. So there may have been things around beforehand. Certainly there's been amateur efforts around long for a long time. They've been around as long as, you know, uh, good efforts have been uh, around. I mean, but the, the, the fact is once open access journals emerged, that was that enabled this to happen because really nobody's going to fake a print journal there's too much involved in it but once open access started it was very easy to hide behind that uh i've got a question here uh probably for john and linda from patricia pascual what uh, i'm wondering what to do when there is no ethical committee how do you um if you find yourself um if you're a patient group or a clinical society and you don't have easy access to an irb how should you proceed Um, well, I, maybe I could take a stab at that. So as, as a editor in chief of, of a journal, uh, it is critical that you have um, some, at least communication with some IRB regarding your project. There are cases as Linda has shown where uh, geographically it may not be required for you to have an ethics committee approval, but we need a letter from you saying that that's not required. Uh, and that needs to come from some IRB. Uh, there are non-institutional based institutional uh, uh, ethics committees um, that many private practice uh, practitioners use, but it will be really important if you're doing human subjects research that we have some sense of a decision made by an ethics committee. And if you're doing animal research, we need the identical thing from your animal care committee. Yes. So uh, this is the right thing. Uh, things to do and ex essentially we have to say that uh, the editors cannot uh, know everything about all the national guidelines according so in a very in a very simple way we can imagine that and it's uh, true for the, almost all the countries that whenever you um, write some uh, clinical data or also a clinical database that you have you should have uh, a, an ethical committee approval and uh, if uh, this is not uh, present for your national guideline, you have to provide some documents supporting what you are saying. Otherwise, the paper is not considered to be eligible for, um, for also for it be reviewed and to, to be published. Um, then we have, we, we will continue a little because we have so many great questions. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a, a comment or a question from Dr. Brado in Canada, where she says, John, you mentioned that reviewers should declare if they sit on other journals, editorial boards when they accept the review. I was not aware of that. Thank you for excellent presentation. So could you please make a few comments on the policy we have in our journals about when you're a reviewer or if you're an editorial board, that, like different levels of conflict of interest? Yeah, so, so first of all, um, much of reviewing is based on an honor system. And so when you are a reviewer and you get a paper coming in, and this happens to us periodically, it's incumbent upon you to define whether you personally believe you have a conflict of interest, all right? Our papers are blinded um, to our reviewers. However, papers are often um, declaring who they come from by virtue of the fact that perhaps in the methods 
um, this was approved by the ethics committee at such and such an institution, or a statement like we have previously published work and it's reference 15, you look at reference 15 and you can identify who those people are. I think you need to make a decision if you have a conflict of interest. There have been rare circumstances where decisions have been made by reviewers uh, in journals that I've been involved in where there are concerns that that decision was made based on perhaps their involvement in competing journals. So I think that um, Anna Maria wants me to make a comment about if you have a leadership position, so you're an editor in chief of an, another journal in sexual medicine, if you're an associate editor, or you sit on an editorial board of another journal in the space, we would ask you to declare that to us uh, if you were pursuing a leadership position in our journal. I think it's nice if you can do, uh, do that communication with us if you're reviewing for our journal, although that's not mandatory. Okay. Do we um, have there's a, uh, I was gonna uh, pull up uh, Monica Kouis's question here. I think I'm saying that right. Um, what is a good solution for improving a paper's English grammar choice of words uh, when written by non-native speakers? She points out that we usually include non a native speaker as a co-author, but in the end, their contribution is really only grammatical corrections. It's probably a good question for Jason. Uh, that is a good question. Um, you know, so in, in certain places now, it's very highly acceptable to actually... Um, pay for a language editing service, but of course there's a cost involved in that. Um, if you ask a non-native English, uh, uh, if you ask a native English speaker to, to, you know, help buff up the paper and make it look much better from a grammar and syntax point of view, it's not appropriate for them to be an author. Um, the appropriate thing to do would be to acknowledge them. And no journal would have a problem with that, but you, 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 cannot, you cannot promise authorship in exchange for uh, a good language edit, okay? So that actually could create an ethical problem for you right there. Um, understand that, um, you know, I mean, journals obviously want, uh, English language journals obviously want good English, but um, if the science is strong, you know, that's, it's, it, it, there may be an element of bias against your paper. Some people are like, gosh, this is hard to read. But the science will win out every time if the journal is a good journal. Um, we will ask you to work hard. We will help you if, 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 it's, if it's that desperate. Certainly, I, there was many a JSM paper that I heavily copy edited before it was sent off to the publisher. Um, but I, I, I do urge you, in light of this whole conversation about ethics, do, do not promise authorship in exchange for an English language edit. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if we got a response to a question from Dr. Petorius, uh, where he writes, I tried to add a plagiarism report to my submission, but I'm not allowed to do it. Isn't it better that we uh, submit our own citation report, plagiarism report? Maybe, um, I, could, maybe I could address that. I, I read that question and yeah. maybe Tim, you can weigh in as well. But um, so I, I think it's, um, it's very honorable that you do that. My comment on doing plagiarism screen at your own institution is to make sure that if you're the senior author and the junior author has written the paper, that you can check that no plagiarism occurred. We are almost certainly, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, going to run our own plagiarism screen no matter what. So there's no need for you to send that in. It really is a, um, a check for you to make sure the paper has been written correctly by perhaps a junior person. Yeah, um, and uh, part of that question also mentioned uh, matches to repositories such um, I think perhaps that might mean uh, if you've put a preprint of your article up um, already somewhere um, that of course leads to a very high plagiarism level 80 90 percent because the text is essentially the same um, we don't do this um, blindfolded we uh, I, I go and check where the text has come from so if I see that the text matches a preprint um, that's fine. It's it's okay to put up a preprint if the text, uh, a lot of the text matches a um, an abstract that you published in a previous conference proceedings. That's absolutely fine too. It's much more when chunks of the text are copied from a completely different article by a different author group. That's the that's the soul of bad. That's the that's the worst examples of text copying. Um, and that's when we take take action. So we, we do assess each one very carefully. Um, 
Can I just add a point there about the preprint stuff? It's, I, I would highly recommend that you, you do check if you've put something up on a preprint server, check with the, the journal you intend to submit to that they will actually allow you to submit. There are some journals out there that are not enlightened and absolutely refuse. They, they will run their the, the authenticate report and say, you know what, you've put this on a preprint, we're not interested. I had to fight that battle with an editor at an origin editorial journal. So if you're not sure about that about that journal, usually they're, they're homepage will tell you their policy just email the editorial office you'll get a response they'll probably tell you yes it's not a problem or yes it is a problem so uh, just uh, that's some little advice there for you uh, tim you. perhaps perhaps uh, we could uh, i suspect there are people on the webinar who don't understand what the concept of preprinting is perhaps you could enlighten them yeah so preprints are actually been around a very long time but mostly in physics um and they originated because in physics and mathematics, the peer review process is very, very long. It can take up to a year or two to actually review an article because in maths, you have to actually redo the work from beginning to end to assess as part of the peer review process. And, and so what people started doing is they started posting the finished version of their manuscript on a site called Archive. And, and that allowed other people to see what they had worked on. It allowed people to claim priority for ideas. And then the manuscript worked its way through peer review and was published in a journal a couple of years later. And, um, and then the, uh, this has spread and spread. And now there is a med archive, which hosts medical preprints. Um, these are handled slightly differently from physics preprints in that they check more carefully for things like um, breaches of uh, patient confidentiality and ethics breaches before allowing them to go online. Um, but they, um, in the same principle that you are able to get your, uh, un your finished manuscript out in front of people to perhaps get informal feedback from them and at the same time claim priority for an idea or a piece of work because everyone can see that it was published on X date on the preprint server. And then it, your article can move through peer review and appear in a, a published journal, be published in a journal at some later date. So they're, they're a very effective way of doing open science whilst still um, remaining within the journal system. But as Jason says, you have to be sure that the journal that you're gonna submit the preprinted article to um, will uh, accept the fact that it's been already been published as a preprint. Attitudes are changing, but in some places that is not, uh, they have not changed fast enough. I think we are about to end, but we have two very quick last questions because there's so many interesting questions. So thank you so much for that. I think this is to maybe to you, John, can you submit to a journal, then also submit abstract for several conferences? So I don't believe that there's a written rule on this. There is an unwritten rule which uh, at least in urology space, where we don't really want to see you presenting an abstract at let's say our Sexual Medicine Society of North America, six minutes podium session on a paper that got published in fall two months previously. So I would encourage authors to time your submission such that um, the work was not formally published before you present. If, however, there is an increase in number of patients or there's some change in methodology or an open label phase of a trial, then I think that's fine. But I, I think there's no written rule, but I would discourage it. That's a good practice. Okay. And maybe this is for you, Jason. What about a reference to an article in a predatory journal? Um, Specific, sorry, uh, specifically what? So I how, think is, this is about if you have a paper and you, you make a reference to a predatory journal. Right. A, pa uh, a paper that's published there. It's in the yeah. reference list. It's in the if, reference list. If it's in your reference list, you know, honestly, probably nobody's going to know. Um, because journals, actually, this is something or other that I, I've even talked to Tim about this, that we might try and do this at some point, is build a simple algorithm to scan through the references and look to see is that journal in PubMed? Is it in the DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and several other databases? If you can't find the the the, the, the journal there, then it would just literally flag it. Doesn't mean to say therefore it's a, it's an illegitimate reference. It just means we didn't find it. Investigate it further. 
Um, but yeah, the whole industry needs this because th there is there is no protection right now. I could fake a reference, and I'm pretty sure I could get it into just about every. <laughs> that no one would know. Don't, so, don't tell anyone. Yeah. Uh, in my with my uh, in AI in publishing hat on, there is a tool called Site. Uh, I've just put it in the chat. Site.ai. Um, which is doing this actually. So Jason, we've been snafued on this. Someone else has <laughs> built this tool, um, which is going to flag um, when people are have put in a citation to a predatory journal or to a retracted article yeah. or an article with uh, an expression of concern about it. So that as you're reading an article, it's much more obvious to you which um, which references are good and which ones are yeah. probably suspect. But I, I, my only hesitation would be that somebody's labeled it a predatory journal uh, because it, it, otherwise it just falls back into all the problems that I just talked about. And um, nobody should be labeling anything predatory, but you can certainly say it's not in any of these databases that are you know, indexing databases that are legitimate. So hopefully that's what they're doing. But uh, anyway, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> It does, and, and thank you for responding to all these very, very nice questions. I think the last one also reflects a little bit that there was a comment from one of our colleagues that he had a publication, a predatory journal, and we know several of, of examples of people contacting the Journal of Sexual and Medicine saying, I don't understand, I don't hear anything about my, my, uh, my manuscript, or why do I have to pay for it? I thought I didn't have to pay, and then it turns out in predatory journals. So we have quite a lot of, of examples of, of many of us who have been cheated by, by these predatory journals. I think I will take the opportunity to close the, the session. Um, first of all, maybe I can have the next slide, Meryl. So first of all, I, I will thank you all for participating, the panelists. I mean, excellent talks. There have been so many comments on the chats about how important this is that you gave excellent talks. And the last one was that he was not aware of any other journals that actually uh, made a webinar on this topic. So thank you so much for your topic uh, selection, for your talks and, and your excellent responses. Um, I have to inform you, I will inform you, be happy to inform you that uh, the webinars will be available on our webpage on the ISSM University in a few days. So if there was something you missed, if you want to look at the references, if you want to get some of the good suggestions and guidelines, then you can go there and look at, at, the, uh, at the presentation. You can also see the previous pre uh, webinars we have had. So please go there and visit us. The next slide. So uh, I also want to make a little advertise uh, for our next webinar, will, which will be on Tuesday, uh, November the 24th. And it's a completely different topic. It's optimizing outcomes for penile prosthesis. So please put it in your calendar and join us. And finally, I think there's one more slide. If there's not, I will just like to say thank you to all of you. I can inform you that we have had people from all the continents. We have attendees from Congo, from Mauritius, from Bangladesh, from the Netherlands, uh, from New York, from South America. So we have uh, had uh, a lot of international representation in the attendees. So thank you to everyone and please join us on our next webinar. Thank you.